My name is John Bishop. It is one o'clock as I film this, and welcome to my first unboxing video. Vinegar Syndrome have just completed their Halfway to Black Friday sale 2019, and uh, I'd like to share with you the fruits of my spree. First off, alongside the company itself, Vinegar Syndrome, I want to thank Mike Bracken, the horror geek, who has been a follower of mine, and I've followed him since we were out. Uh, reviewers on the Opinions.com shopping site many moons ago. He is a horror geek in his own right, and uh, he's been making the transition to video. He, I haven't fully made that yet. I still like to write, and I chances are I will write about most of the movies, if not all of the ones that I got from the Vinegar Syndrome sale. But he has been a great inspiration, and I do want to thank him up front. And recently, Vinegar Syndrome have just announced a few new titles. Um, I hope to pick those up soon. But their 2019 Halfway to Black Friday sale, I got the chance to pick up a lot of the movies that were on my must-see list, as well as some interesting little curios and uh, a couple of their exclusive titles. And Vinegar Syndrome, they're a company like Arrow Video, who specialize in restoring genre films and putting them out in beautiful new transfers from original film elements. The title of Vinegar Syndrome itself refers to uh, the deterioration of acetate-based film, and yet the company has been giving VHS staples and cult films of all stripes, horror, mystery, suspense, black exploitation, even softcore, and uh, on occasion, a nursing little art house oddity, a new lease on life. And the transfers I've seen so far, and the treatment of them have been nothing short of spectacular. Like I said, they rival Arrow Video for just overall care and uh, attention to, uh, the, to the landscape of fringe cinema. So, the titles that I do currently own by Vinegar Syndrome, I do have a couple. I want to mention off the top of my head. I do own Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song from 1971, the Melvin Van Peebles film that kickstarted the black exploitation movement. I also own Mark Lawrence's horror oddity Pigs, which stars his daughter Tony as a traumatized young woman who uh, moves in with uh, Mark Lawrence's demented farmer who's been feeding his pigs human flesh. And also, there's a great vampire film from 1990 called Death by Temptation, directed by James Bond III, and it, is, uh, and it was lensed by Ernest Dickerson, and it stars Sam Jackson. So there's a nice Spike Lee connection there. But it's an interesting little movie. Also, Penitentiary I also currently own, from Jama Fanaka, who uh, has several Vinegar Syndrome uh, releases. One of them I'll discuss later. Nightmare Sisters is also another I currently own. I picked up a signed copy from actress Brink Stevens at a convention. And also I'll talk about the director, David Dakota, and also Brink Stevens further when I delve deeper into my package. And as appetizer for the package I did get, I picked up a few titles through Zia Records and Mesa. Joe Bob Briggs uh, recently showed Blood Harvest on the last drive-in, and that film from 1987, which stars Tiny Tim as Marvelous Mervo, is an interesting little slasher movie, which I hope to write about in depth, like all other movies I'm discussing about to discuss. Also picked up Body Melt from Australia, directed by Philip Brophy, a satire and health fads, which also features lots of gooey makeup effects, courtesy of uh, Bob McCarran, who did the work for Peter Jackson's Dead Alive. Also picked up Incubus from director John Huff from 1982, which stars John Cassavetes in the lead role. Also, I picked up through eBay one of Vinegar Syndrome's more bizarre titles called Horror House on Highway 5. In case you haven't heard of it, it was a film that was directed by Richard Casey 
originally started filming in 1978, didn't get completed for a few years later. He went on to direct videos for Blue Waster Cult in the interim, and it didn't get released on video until about 1985-86. And it's a, like several of the Vinegar Syndrome releases, a regional horror film, and a very strange one at that. It definitely owes a tip of the hat to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, uh... The titles that I picked up a couple years ago during another Black Friday sale, Liquid Sky, that one is currently my favorite of the Vinegar Syndrome releases thus far because it is one of the defining cult films of a generation, like Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song was to the 70s. Liquid Sky is to the 80s, a really offbeat, really neon-flavored alien invasion flick involving a fashion model, lots of heroin use, a German scientist, and several other interesting characters. One of them is played by uh, Paula Shepard, who starred in Alice Sweet Alice, or Communion or Holy Terror, and that one's going to get released through Arrow Video soon, and that one is a definite must-see. Also picked up the Clint Howard film Ice Cream Man during that particular sale, and one of the extras involves Joe Bob Briggs. It's the complete episode of Monster Vision, the summer school edition that he made for Ice Cream Man when it aired on TNT, and it has Clint Howard as a guest. And another film that, uh, from the director of Psychos in Love, which I also is one of the Vinegar Syndrome titles I previously own, um, is called Disconnected, and sadly that one went out of print during the Black Friday sale, but I do own the slipcover edition like I did Liquid Sky and uh, Ice Cream Man. And it's a regional slasher film too. It stars Francis Reigns from The Mutilator and the uh, lead from Psychos in Love. And it's a very odd little movie. If you've ever seen a, you probably have not seen a brutal sex crime scored to an XTC song Chances are, you need to see Disconnected to rectify that. Interesting little movie. Um, and I think I've talked enough about what I currently own. And like I said, the Vinegar Syndrome half of the Black Friday sale gave me the chance to pick up movies that were on my must-see list. They're the ones I've been holding out on for a while. And sadly, there are several others I'm going to hold out on until next sale likely Black Friday itself. For instance, Cutting Class, the slasher film from 1989 that stars Jill Sholin from The Stepfather and Popcorn, Beautiful Lady, and uh, her then-boyfriend Brad Pitt as her boyfriend in that film. Also, Martin Mull and Roddy McDowell appear in it. That one, sadly, I did not pick up. It's got several interesting interviews, including with Jill Sholin, and Donovan Leach, who plays the strange kid in the movie, and uh, a commentary from the Hysteria Lives group, who did several commentaries for films like Incubus and Splatter University that are Vinegar Syndrome releases. And I just, I'll hold off on that one until the next sale. There are a few others that are intriguing, but I did not pick up, like The Children from 1980, and Mausoleum from 1983, which features effects by the late John Carl Beekler, may rest in peace. Also, The Candy Tangerine Man, I did not get the chance to pick that up, nor any of the Rudy Ray Moore movies that they currently have. They put out a few of them, P.D. Wheatstraw, The Human Tornado, Dolomite, of course, and uh, Disco Godfather. And, uh, Jama Fanaka, who directed the Penitentiary movies, he made Welcome Home Brother Charles and Emma May in the mid-70s before Penitentiary, and they're a double feature release from Vinegar Syndrome, and sadly, I slept on that one. I'm going to pick that one up definitely later. But, those are the ones I missed out on. But, I do own several, and now I'm going to share with you the 19 titles that I picked up during Halfway to Black Friday 
2019. Uh, we're going to start with uh, from 1972, a movie called Dear Dead Delilah, which is from the author of The Fury, which of course was made into that Brian De Palma film of 1978. This is the slipcover edition of Dear Dead Delilah. And Vinegar Syndrome, these beautiful slipcovers, they put a couple movies they previously released out on video, like Raw Forest and Slaughterhouse, with the uh, beautiful new design art. But, sadly, I did not pick those up either. Like I said, I had to choose wisely, and this was uh, one that caught my eye, because, as the back cover art explains, this is a cheerfully grim blending of Southern Gothic stylings, murder mystery structure, and proto-slasher gore. And uh, John Ferris, the director of this one, like I said, made The Fury, directs Agnes Moorhead and Will Gear from The Waltons in, a, in this really... I haven't seen the movie yet. I haven't seen a lot of the movies in this one. Like I said, I hope to get more in-depth when I actually start writing proper reviews for each of the titles. But, as, I, as they described it, Southern Gothic, Murder Mystery, Pro Slasher Gore, this is definitely right up my alley. And I had the chance to pick this one up. Dear Dead Delilah from 1972. I'm going to try and go through these as quickly as possible. Because I got 18 more to go now. One movie I started to watch yesterday because it was a fairly bad day for me. I didn't get the chance to watch it all the way because I was just dead tired from the stress. But, Demon Wind. Yes. Spam in a Cabin. 1984 was the film. And, uh... I don't know how to describe the first 20 minutes thus far. It is a demon possession film. It involves a young man who uh, investigates the mysterious disappearance of his grandparents by going out in the sticks of his friends. And uh, from what I understand, it is one of those uh, must-see bad movies, the kind you show to your friends on bad movie night. I got a couple of those in here. And uh, this one's got a couple interesting video interviews with the uh, the producer, one of the actors, and uh, the cinematographer. And I've heard it talked about quite enough that I finally plopped down the 15 bucks to get myself a copy. Demon Wind, 1984. Another slipcover edition, this is a Canadian film called Sudden Fury from 1975. And this is what kind of like a wrong man suspense mystery film. It involves a cuckolded husband who decides to kill his wife and stage it as an auto wreck. But unfortunately for him, a good Samaritan comes along and uh, foils his plan, and the guy becomes implicated in the murder, so it's up to him to clear his name and uh, uncover the real killer, the cheated husband. The explosive story of an accident that turned into murder. The slipcover edition here, directed by Brian DeMood, and it never really got much of a theatrical or video release, sadly. It was nearly impossible to see it in the 30 years plus since it came out, but luckily Vinegar Syndrome got on that, so... I'm going to get the chance to watch this. It's got a commentary track from the director, Brian DeMood. It's got an isolated score by Matthew McCauley, the composer. And, uh, like I said, if you like Canadian exploitation films, this one is definitely one of Vinegar Syndrome's must-owns. And I had the chance to pick that up. Another of the uh, must-see bad movies that people mention a lot that I finally get the chance to put in my video shelf is called Night Train to Terror from 1985. 
And this is an omnibus film, an anthology film, but it's unique in that the three stories being told, these were all previously released or previously unfinished films, two of them from the same director, and uh, the producer director of this particular omnibus film, I would say, like I said, the directorial credits are off the wall with this one is uh, Jay Schlossberg Cohen. He must have filmed the uh, wraparound segments, which involve uh, a train ride involving God and the devil. So you get automatic flashbacks like two of a kind or second time lucky. Sadly, there's no Diane Franklin in this movie, which would have definitely, I would have picked this up a lot faster if Diane Franklin were involved in this one naturally. Lovely lady like Jill Schoen, but this one has uh, one of the uh, films used in the is called Greta and it's about a young woman obsessed with death taking part in an unspeakable ritual of Russian roulette and you get the full version of that film instead of the chopped down version used in Night Train of Terror and of course I would be remiss if I didn't mention Everybody's got something to do, everybody but you, which basically describes my 2 a.m. routine right now. <laughs> Lovely little movie with a, I would say, healthy cult reputation, but it's definitely one of those Z movies that, yeah, you have to see to believe. Night Train of Terror from 1985 has a commentary from the Hysteria Lives group like Incubus and Splatter University and Cutting Class. Um, you know your 80s movies if you're watching this, so uh, if you know, like I talked about Nightmare Sisters, of course Brink Stevens is in it, I'll get to her in a sec, but one of her co-stars in that film and the sorority babes at the Slimeball Bowlerama, of course, is the legendary Linnea Quigley. From Return of the Living Dead, Night of the Demons, Witch Trap, and several others, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Graduation Day. I could talk about the various films she's been in for an hour or so, but a couple I missed were Murder Weapon and Deadly Embrace, both from the late 80s, and both directed by David Dakota, who made Nightmare Sisters and uh, The Sorority Babes, The Slimeball Bolorama with Brink, Linnea, and Michelle Bauer. And for Deadly Embrace, he went by the pseudonym of Ellen Cabot to give it a nice romance novel intrigue. Another person who went by a pseudonym is one of the stars of Murder Weapon. Uh, a guy named Damon Charles appears in this movie, but of course, Damon Charles is a pseudonym for Eric Freeman. Garbage day! I could not resist the opportunity to pick up Murder Weapon for the sight of Linnea Quigley and Eric Freeman in the same movie alone. That is just catnip for me. I mean, Freeman, of course, Ricky from Silent Night by Night Part 2, he is the kind of guy who flexes his eyebrow muscles so much it would make the rock envious. And, oh my goodness, I am excited for this one in particular. Uh, Murder Weapon also, like a lot of videos, came out with this ridiculously misleading cover art that doesn't feature Linnea Quigley or her co-star Karen Russell. It actually features two other models and it makes it look a lot more like an action film than the uh, horror film it truly is. It's about two women who are previously were incarcerated who decide to throw a party and invite their old boyfriends over, but they keep getting killed off. And uh, Deadly Embrace involves uh, a gardener who uh, arouses the suspicion of Jan Michael Vincent. And uh, Michelle Bauer appears in uh, Deadly Embrace alongside Linnea Quigley, so once again, a nice meeting of the 80s Scream Queens. Of course, they were in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers together. And that one, I don't know if Vinegar Syndrome will ever get around to that one, but 
Wouldn't it be nice? This is Murder Weapon and Deadly Embrace, both late 80s, both starring Linnea Quigley, both directed by David Dakota, and David and Linnea do commentary for both films, and you get introductions by David for both films, and outtakes for Deadly Embrace. Oh, and Lyle Wagner is in this too. Okay, another one of the films that was on my must-see list. If you uh, watch the cinema snob, you'll know that one of his most one of his most hilarious early videos was this film called The Newest Colony of the Dead. And you remember the gag where uh Inky Dinky Doo Da Morning. The director of that film, of course, is Mark Pirro, and in 1987, he made Death Row Game Show. This came out the same year, of course, as The Running Man, but whereas The Running Man is very action-oriented and tailored to the persona of Arnold Schwarzenegger, this one is a far schlockier, far more Mel Brooks, Zucker Brothers, Abraham-type parody of callous game show hosts of TV advertising. There are several RoboCop-style uh, mock commercials in this one. And this came out in video like Liquid Sky from Media Home Entertainment, who are one of the kings of 80s horror titles on VHS. Alongside, I would say, Vestron Video, definitely. Um, it stars John McCafferty as Chuck Todan, who uh, is the host of a game show where uh, criminals on death row get the chance to either get a stay of execution or get killed on live TV, or at least on pre-recorded TV. There are several jokes involving that. Um, like I said, this one was one that I've been wanting to see for a while because I do love schlocky comedies and uh, the fact that it is involved with the director of Newest Colony of the Dead kind of piqued my curiosity. And it's got commentary by director Mark Pirro, the actor who plays the game show host, John McCafferty, like I said, and the actress Robin Blythe, who plays a uh, Gloria Stern virgin. From what I understand, there's also a pretty weird three-minute stretch of the film, where it's a film within a film as a dream sequence. So it's definitely one of those offbeat little comedies that I can imagine New World Pictures would have released, but it got released through Crown International instead, and they released My Chauffeur with Deborah Foreman, and that's another Vinegar Syndrome release that sadly still need to pick that one up. But yeah, Death Row Game Show, 1987. Win and you live, lose and it's curtain number three, says the video tagline. Okay. Going back to uh, the Scream Queens of the decade, the 1980s, Linnea Quigley was one, Michelle Bauer was another, and the third, of course, being Brink Stevens, who has a juicy role in this film called Grandmother's House. And this is another one that went like hotcakes in the Vinegar Syndrome site. There is a couple copies at the Zia Records I went to, but of course, you don't get the lovely little slipcover here front and back, and it's directed by Peter Rader, who would go on to be one of the writers of the Kevin Costner uh, curiosity, I would say, Waterworld, and yeah, Brink Stevens is in this one, and so is the lead kid from Cry Wilderness, Eric Foster is his name, and he plays a young man who, uh, whose father dies, and he and his sister are sent to live off with their grandparents, but he starts to have suspicions when the strange woman, played by Brink Stevens, turns up, and there are a lot of skeletons in the closet to unpack, and like I said, the fact that Stevens is in this alone, of course, she's one of the great beauties of the 80s. I'm talking about Diane Franklin and Jill Sholin and Linnea Quigley, you tend to romanticize all the 
starlets of the period, Deborah Foreman, another one. But they put out a lot of interesting movies, and this is one of them, produced by Nico Mastarakis, who, uh, of course, made the legendarily depraved Island of Death. He made The Zero Boys, another 80s starlet, Kelly Maroney, in that one. And, uh, this is definitely an interesting one. Brink Stevens and Peter Rader provide new video interviews in this one. There's also, uh, cinematographer Peter Jensen, the acclaimed Steadicam operator, does an interview here. And there's, a uh, archival making a featurette that includes the short film which inspired this. So it's got a nice supply of extras for what is, once again, an interesting little film that, when it came out in video, was just called Grandma's House, not Grandmother's House. And we're on to the next movie. It's Pride Month this uh, June, so I figured I would share with you Night's Hitty-Five's Buddies from director Arthur Bresson Jr., and this was released in 1985 through New Line Cinema. Right after the time Nightmare Elm Street came out, they were still uh, basically known as a exhibition company. They, of course, put out John Waters films like Polyester and several other films. Reefer Madness was one that they liked to show, and that appears in uh, Elm Street 4, of course, in one of the dream sequences. But this one is... Uh, a film about a straight man and a gay man who form a friendship when the gay man starts wasting away from AIDS. And this preceded Parting Glances and Long Time Companion and the way of the films that dealt straightforward with the AIDS epidemic. And like I said, it's Pride Month, so I did want to check this out. My curiosity compelled me to it. And like I said, another on the must-see list. As far as I was concerned, this one took the top priority. And it's got video interviews with the actor David Schachter, who plays the, uh, the buddy to the gay man in the film, played by Jeff Edholm. Um, it's got a video interview with the film historian Thomas Wow. It's got trailer stills. And of course, like all the Vinegar Syndrome titles, a restored transfer from original elements in 2K, and uh, definitely something I want to check out. Looks like a beautiful film, and like I said, perhaps the first movie to tackle the AIDS epidemic head on, and uh, certainly something that is something special. Also something special is uh, films that were released by Troma that Vinegar Syndrome, well, they weren't officially released by Troma. Films like Graduation Day and The Children from the Early 80s, they were not official Troma productions. I would say a film like Splatter University was a lot closer to that because it was being marketed by Troma as a Lloyd Kaufman, Michael Hurst presentation. But The Children and Graduation Day, they were straightforward releases just looking for anybody who would pick them up. But one of Troma's uh, more Ballyhooed films, I would say, was Dead Dudes in the House, which was also known as The Dead Next Door, also known as The House on Tombstone Hill. And this is another slipcover edition for a film that came out in 1988, or was made in 1988, and it's another Spam the Cabin movie like Demon Wind, which involves what I hope are some pretty gnarly gore effects. And it has, uh, yeah, Ed French is one of, the, one of the wizards behind the scenes in this movie. Like Bob McCarran from uh, The Body Melt. And it's got interviews of three of those dead dudes in the house. And another name that interests me is... Uh, the guy who's doing the uh, moderation for the audio commentary with the director, James Rifle, is uh, Chris Pajali, who uh, 
he runs the Temple of Schlock, a blogspot page, and he was, uh, along with uh, Edwin Samuelson and Michael Gingold, of course, the three guys provided commentary on uh, several of the Synapse, edition, Synapse Films 42nd Street Forever compilations of trailers, and the guy knows his shit, like Gingold and Samuelson, and their commentaries are very funny and very informative. And so, like the Hysteria Lives, I respect anybody who, uh, like Mike Bracken, who is inspiring me to do the video. I do have a great respect for the genre enthusiasts like them, who, uh, like I said, they're big inspirations to me, and hopefully I can reflect that in my writing. But this is, once again, The House on Tombstone Hill, The Dead Come Home, or as Troma calls it, Dead Dudes in the House. Okay. We got a few more to go before we get to the halfway to Black Friday exclusives. Um, director Brett Piper, he made a couple of uh, micro-budget sci-fi films that weren't released in America on VHS. They've been uh, more internationally known, I would say. One of them is called Battle for the Lost Planet, front cover here, and it was also known as Galaxy, and it came out in 1985. The uh, sequel to that film is called Mutant War from 1988, and it stars Matt Mittler, Ed Jr. from The Mutilator, as Harry Trent, a spy who uh, escapes in a broken down spaceship and discovers all sorts of alien and mutant creatures and gets involved in these, uh, I would say he's kind of a, I would hope he's a successor to Bruce Campbell from The Evil Dead. And uh, of course, Mittler, he was one of the riot comic relief in uh, The Mutilator. He was also in a, it's a couple of Tim Kincaid's films, I think. He was in Breeders, definitely, with Francis Raines from uh, The Mutilator 2. He was also in Dead Time Stories. He was the werewolf in Little Red Riding Hood. And he was in Alan Parsons' project video called Prime Time, in which he plays a, a mannequin who comes to life, which is very interesting. But he's the uh, hero of this film, and uh, I do like The Mutilator. I do own bedtime, Dead Time Stories, too. Own both of those. So, and I do love ambitious sci-fi made on a shoestring. So, this is the slipcover edition of the double feature for Battle for the Lost Planet and Mutant War. And it includes director's introductions by Brett Piper for both films, and an interview with the uh, filmmaker, too. There's an original trailer for Mutant War as well. There's not a lot of extras in this one, but this was one that I had to pick up because when the leaves of summer turn red and gold, I'll, 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 I'll spare you my fall break rendition. But back to uh, Jama Fanaka, the director of Welcome Home Brother Charles and Emma May. Um, Penitentiary is one of Vinegar Syndrome's, uh, I would say, most well-known titles. It's like Liquid Sky and Sweet Sweetback. You've probably heard the name Penitentiary, and it stars Leon Isaac Kennedy as Too Sweet, the uh, prize fighter in prison. They released Penitentiary, and it was a pretty popular release, so they got Penitentiary 2 as well. And this came out in video from MGM UA, and uh, so definitely it was a much more wider release than uh, most, of the most of the more obscure titles that Vinegar Syndrome have preserved. But Leon Isaac Kennedy is back as Too Sweet, and uh, once again he finds himself uh, in a situation out of his control because uh, his arch nemesis, half dead, 
played by Ernie Hudson in one of his early roles, gets out of jail, kills his girlfriend Clarice, and uh, inspires Too Sweet to get his own back against the uh, vicious half-dead. But the big thing about Penitentiary 2, of course, I pity the fool who doesn't remember how big a year 1982 was for Mr. T, who, uh, of course, the same year Clubber Lang duked it out with Rocky Balboa, he turns up in this film, too, the one and only Mr. T. And, uh, turns out Ernie Hudson had a small role in that Rudy Ray Moore film, The Human Tornado. Another reason I want to check that one out, so... Yeah, this was before Ernie Hudson became a name, thanks to, uh, Ghostbusters, and... Certainly, I hope I expect a nice slice of ham from him in this movie. Like I said, I love my ham bone villains, and this looks like it's gonna be a... a heaven... a heavenly experience. And it's got archival interviews and commentary with director Jamal Fanaka and an uh, interview with Leon Isaac Kennedy. There is a Penitentiary 3 for the record, of course. It was released by Canon Films, though, so I wouldn't expect there to be a Vinegar Syndrome release of that. I'm surprised Shout Factory didn't get on that yet. It came out in 1987. It stars Leon Isaac Kennedy again and directed by Jamal Fanaka. And, uh, interestingly enough, it's a canon film, and it stars Rick from The Last American Virgin, Steve Anton, so... That's, uh, something hopefully we'll see down the line, a home video release of Penitentiary 3. But, speaking of interesting actors from cult films, uh... Another movie that was on my must-see list comes from the early 90s, and it's from a director named... Alexander Cassini, and it's called Star Time. And this is another one of those isolated, uh, isolated characters, psychological thrillers, uh, I'm basically thinking of, like, the early 80s stuff, not just, like, the king of comedy, which, like this one, is about a media-obsessed youngster who goes off the deep end, but, you know, the more grindhouse stuff, maniac, don't go in the house, don't answer the phone, in which the characters are basically, uh, demented men who probably look no less disheveled than me, but have serious impulse control problems. Um, this film stars Michael St. Gerard, Maureen Teefy, and John P. Ryan, and in case you need primers on who all those three actors are, or at least their main roles, uh, Gerard, Michael St. Gerard, was, a uh, Link in the original John Waters' Hairspray. Maureen Teefy was Doris in the original Alan Parker fame from 1980. And John P. Ryan, of course, the great character actor, and father of the Davis baby, from the late, great Larry Cohen's It's Alive in 1973. Or 1974, I'm sorry if I goof on the date. Like I said, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I do when I get this ready for the next uh, title, which I'm going to discuss, but this is a movie that, yeah, like I said, right up my alley, it actually got a nice review from the LA Times, and uh, when Buddies came out, Janet Maslin from the New York Times gave it a semi-positive review. She admired its ambition, but you never saw a movie deal with AIDS and such candor as Buddies, and while the topic of Star Time has been covered many times before, like I said, in something like The King of Comedy, this one looks like it's gonna be a trip, and I hope to actually enjoy myself watching a really downer film, which might seem like an oxymoron, but I have a wide variety of tastes, and Vinegar Syndrome are catering to them. And another movie, uh, which, holy mackerel, we need to talk about Dennis Hopper, the American Dreamer. This is a film documenting the making of Hopper's The Last Movie, his uh, directorial effort from the early 70s. Of course, 
Easy Rider was the film that established the boundaries of the new Hollywood, and it was uh, Hopper's, Hopper's baby all the way. And uh, interestingly enough, this was co-directed by L.M. Kit Carson, who uh, of course is a scriptwriter of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, which features Hopper himself as Lieutenant Enright, lefty. And uh, this is a interesting little film. I heard one of my critic friends discuss this. His name is Jerry Saravia. But I want to see it for myself because I do appreciate the legacy of Dennis Hopper a lot. Even in the schlockiest stuff, he's still a guy to watch. And, you know, you've seen the stories about Mad Dog Morgan in the Not Quite Hollywood documentary. But this looks to be a, a nice candid portrayal of a, one of the more idiosyncratic actors and filmmakers of the, of the generation when the rules changed for Hollywood. And I do, I do love Dennis Hopper's movies. Like I said, he, he came back in a big way thanks to Blue Velvet, Hoosiers, and even Chainsaw 2. But, like I said, Dennis Hopper, the American Dreamer, and uh, Chris Pajali of Temple of Shock provides the booklet notes for this one. I'll open it up and read it myself eventually. Whew! I got five more to go. Thanks for sticking with me. We're going to get to something a bit less pretentious now. We're talking your basic punk versus redneck vigilante film from uh, 19... 87 called Punk Vacation and if you know your history of video maybe you might have seen the cover art for this one it came out through Radon Home Video and like Murder Weapon that Linnea Quigley film I talked about earlier which stars her and uh, Garbage Day Freeman oh I gotta watch that one um, this one had very very misleading cover art that did not do justice to the film. In it, it's just like four people who look more like heavy metal rockers and punks uh, posing with uh, whips and chains and guns. And it just looks ridiculous. It's got nothing to do with the basic premise of this film, which uh, involves a group of punks out in Hickville who, uh, one of them gets pissed off at a phone booth for eating his money. So the owner comes out to threaten him with a shotgun. And uh, they get their own back by beating up the old man to death and uh, traumatizing the daughter. So they're basically like punks in the death wish sense. And uh, there is a revenge plot by the, uh, the old man's family. And uh, the lead punkette in this film leader of the uh, punk tribe in this film. She fashions herself as a warrior type. She bears quite more than a passing resemblance to uh, Anne Carlyle from Liquid Sky, in my opinion. But she's Roxanne Rogers, the actress who plays the punk. Uh, she was a... I would say she probably, hopefully still is, a close friend of Robert England. I mean, she was in uh, his 976 Evil as a waitress in that film. And uh, although you don't hear from her, there is video, there are video, video interviews with uh, the producer, actor, Stephen, Stephen Fussy, and uh, the producer's assistant, stunt person, Stephen Rowland, and as well as a massive still gallery, it says. So if you haven't seen the cover art for the VHS release of Punk Vacation, you'll definitely see it on the DVD release from Vinegar Syndrome. And it sure is ridiculous. It looks more like a John Michael Thor movie than it does a punk versus redneck vigilante thriller. Okay, one more, one more, and then we get to the, uh, the big three. The Halfway to Black Friday 2019 exclusives. House of the Dead. And of course, we're not talking to Uwe Boll here. We're talking about director Sharon Miller, a film that was made in 1978. 
And it also went by many alternate titles too, through its uh, checkered history on video. I believe there was a company in 1983 that released it, JTL Films, and they released it by the proper title of House of the Dead. And uh, it came out on video again through Monarch Home Video, I would say probably late 80s. VHS Collector doesn't give a specific year, but it came out as The Zone of the Dead. And it's also called Alien Zone, based on the uh, little plastic thing here. And uh, it's a slipcover edition, as you can tell. Four tales of intrigue and horror await anyone brave enough to enter the House of the Dead. And it was made in Oklahoma, once again a regional, low budget, featuring atmospheric photography by Ken Gibb of Drive-In Massacre fame. Oh, by the way, uh, Punkfication, the cinematographer in this one is uh, Don Coscarelli's regular. And, like I said, if you watch a lot of old B-movies, you see a lot of great cameramen get their start. Like I said, uh, Last American Virgin, interestingly enough, the DP is Adam Greenberg, who would of course go from Canon to Cameron and uh, would shoot Near Dark, which is fucking one of the best movies of the 80s, bar none. And uh, he would have a nice Hollywood career. He uh, the same year Near Dark came out, there was also La Bamba, even Three Men and a Baby, which he lends. But I may have talked less about House of the Dead. I'm very sorry. Like I said, I'm going to talk more about it when I actually write my reviews of these films. But this one actually has audio interviews with uh, the director, Sharon Miller, and the scriptwriter, David O'Malley. And, like I said... You gotta love those regional horror movies like Disconnected and How Horror House on Highway 5. They usually pull the biggest surprises on you, even though they are basically a chainsaw massacre slasher clones. You gotta love your genre of cinema, I do. And uh, with that being said, these are the three, the big three. These are the ones that, yeah, one of them in particular, we're going to build from uh, 80 to 1,000 when we discuss these three. The first movie we're going to talk about, well, these two, uh, the first two, were films released in the 80s by New World Pictures. And uh, another regional horror film, like Disconnected and the Alien Zone, House of the Dead, and uh, Horror House on Highway 5, is uh, Mountaintop Motel Massacre. The immortal tagline this one is, Don't disturb Evelyn, she already is. And, uh, what can I say? It's called Mountaintop Motel Massacre, and so we're expecting something along the lines of a Toby Hooper film in itself, you know? Like Eaten Alive, which, uh, involved a motel, a deranged person. There are no alligators in this one. Uh, yet. I have yet to confirm that, but hey. Evelyn runs the Mountaintop Motel, a cluster of ramshackle cabins nestled deep in the Texas countryside. But Evelyn isn't all there. Tormented by ghastly voices and visions, which periodically cause her to lose her grip on reality, until one fateful day, lost in a bout with insanity, she unwillingly murders her young daughter. And so... What we get here is another psychological thriller slash slasher movie, uh, which uh, is directed by Jim McCulloch Sr., Creature from the Black Lake, which I have not heard of, but it's got cinematography by Joseph Wilcox, who worked on Roots. So this is probably going to be a very good-looking movie for a, a low-budget regional horror film. And this was made in 1983. New World Pictures put it out theatrically and on video. 
in the mid 80s, like three years after it was finished. So it sat on the shelf for a while before the, the studio gave it a fighting chance. And uh, no doubt it, uh, it came out on the heels of far more interesting movies like The Stuff and uh, even Transylvania 6 5000. But I'm glad that Vinegar Syndrome have uncovered this movie and have put it out as a Black Friday exclusive. Can't wait to watch it myself, as with all these movies. Um, also from New World, also from 1985. And also, more interesting than it has any right to be, this is largely because of the personnel involved, is called Lust in the Dust. From director Paul Bartel. Death Race 2000, Eating Raul. He is, of course, a long-time New World Pictures uh, staple, staple from uh, back in the days when Roger Corman was the producer. And, uh, of course, you know him from Rock and Roll High School and Piranha and Eating Raul. Big, bulky guy. Famously uh, balding, bearded. Who are the Ram Ones? Who are the Ramones? Oh, oh, he was in Gremlins too, as the uh, guy who drafts Hulk Hogan into uh, threatening the Gremlins to get the fuck out of the theater. <laughs> oh my god. But yeah, he is uh, one of the few people who took.